Welcome, LA Progressive friends and family. Um, we're delighted to have with us again, uh, Dr. Rick Wolf. Um, for those of you who follow the LA Progressive, Rick Wolf really needs no introduction, but I'm gonna go ahead and just briefly introduce him anyway. Um, Rick Wolf is an economist, um, a renowned economist who um, has been educated in the institutes of learning that are very revered in the United States, Stanford, Yale, Harvard. I think I got that right, right, Rick, right, Rick? Yes, you did, you did. Uh, and, um, but what we're gonna be talking about today is a book that he has written called Understanding Capitalism. And this book is a, it's a short book, it's an easy read, but it really gives you the fundamentals of capitalism that most of us do not get when we attend school um, in the United States. So welcome, Rick. Thank you so much for writing this book. I have been devouring it. And there's a couple of, of chapters that I want you to go over, but but I just want you to just talk and then Dick is gonna ask you a question and then I'm gonna ask you a question. You were already saying some things that we had to stop you before we hit the record button because you just, <laughs> you just go on. But talk to us about why you wrote this book. Okay, well, thank you very much for all your support over the years. I value very much what the LA Progressive has done over the years. Uh, you've printed my articles and many other people's. You've brought them to the attention of people in that area. Uh, it's extraordinary. I mean, anybody ever asked me anything about Southern California, I say, stop. There are people there who know everything that's going on, who are connected to everybody and every, don't talk to me, talk to them and uh, put them on to you. And, you know, we did that left forum for a while with you and many, many experiences together. Uh, so I appreciate this opportunity, but everything that you do. I wrote the book basically for a simple reason. I have been, I've been an activist all my life. I, I don't know if you know, but in, in 1985, we formed the Green Party of New Haven, Connecticut, and I was the candidate for mayor of that city. I ran for office. Uh, I got 10% of the vote the first time out. Two years later, 1987, I ran on the Green Party ticket for the Board of Aldermen. That's like the city council that runs New Haven. And I got 47% of the vote. Uh, and I was called the red green all the time in the local newspaper. But, you know, if you work real hard, if you're part, I have a wife, I have two children, they go to the public school, people knew me, I was active. The fact that I was leftist didn't make a difference at all. I like to tell people, because I think it's true, that if I had stayed in New Haven and continued, I would have been elected to mayor. Uh, you know, it would have been likely to happen. And that's not, you know, it's not against what I believe. It's because of what I believe. Anyway, throughout all these kinds of activities, I was always frustrated that people, good people, hardworking people, activists of all kinds, and the sympathizers in the community had a very hard time linking whatever the problem was that concerned them racism, sexism, um, destroying the environment, being anti-immigrant, I mean, you name it, they did not understand the linkage between what they were trying to make better and the economic system we live in. And so they tended to blame things and people that weren't the real cause of the problem and to make proposals for changes that wouldn't solve the problem because they didn't deal with the economic reality of, of, of what you're doing. And I get frustrated. I would explain it to people and they'd be very kind and they'd listen to me. And some of them would say, thank you, you made that clearer. But you know, nobody else was doing that. There's no reinforcement for people who have that kind of an insight based on their own lives or their jobs or their work. They needed something they could go back to a week later, a month later, read up on a little bit to reinforce their understanding that there was stuff going on in the economy that was producing the problem they were trying to solve, that was blocking the solution they were trying to advance. 
So I said, you know, I can do that. I can write a short, accessible book that has in it a lot of what you need to know. Everything? No, of course not. But, you know, there's a chapter on the myths, the way that the, the capitalist system has shrouded itself in make-believe, in, in stories that are repeated so often that people believe them rather than understanding how this system works. I've tried to show them, for example, that commonplace, you know, commonsensical ideas are sometimes right, but are sometimes way wide of the mark. For example, the New York Times refers to capitalism, which it does now, by the way, more than it used to, by talking about it as synonymous with the market system. An awful lot of people think that in order to have a market, you have to have capitalism. Or if you have a market, well, then that means capitalism. No, it doesn't. It never did. That's wrong. People think in order to buy and sell stuff, you have to have capitalism. No, you don't. Well, now, Americans should know better, right? Because if you go to any southern state, you can find in a, its major cities a monument somewhere in that state that says this was where we had the slave market. Okay, so we know, don't we? We even learn, even in, in schools that don't teach it properly, that once upon a time we bought and sold human beings, slaves brought from Africa. So that was a market, but we don't call that capitalism. We call it slavery. Likewise, in the Middle Ages, when you had feudalism, lords and serfs, it's easy to show you there were markets all over the place. Every major European city has monuments to its history when it was a market. That's what a city was, the place where the market took happen. You know, it's sort of, so why do you call capitalism a market? Well, it's because it distracts people from what is unique about the capitalist system. It's the only system so far that the human race has created that has the following peculiarity. Some of the people, like you and me, sell their own minds and bodies to other people who buy them. And we have names for these people. The buyer is called the employer, and the seller is called the employee. You don't have that in slavery. The slaves didn't sell because they were somebody else's property. They couldn't sell their own labor any more than a horse can sell its own ability to pull a plow. So slavery is between two people, one of whom is the owner and the other one is the property. In feudalism, there was a ceremony. If you ever study feudalism in Europe, you'll know that the ceremony was the person who became the serf got down on one knee and promised to serve, to honor, to obey, and to love the other person who was the Lord. And the Lord said to the serf, I will protect you. I will help you. And the church was there to sanctify the whole thing. That The Lord came and put the flat side of the sword on the shoulder of the serf, and, and that and it was a relationship of obligation. By the way, I'll leave it to the feminists to explain to us the very remarkable thing that the what a man and a woman say to each other in a marriage ceremony, that's taken from slavery. I promise to love, honor, and cherish you. That's what they said then, which is why marriages can very often end up looking a lot like Lord and Serf. Of course, present company accepted. Uh, but, you know, employer-employee is what's unique about capitalism. Because, you know, think about it. The employer, and this is why people don't want to hear or learn this lesson. We all kind of half know. The employers is a tiny group. It's the guy who owns the business. If it's a corporation, it's the board of directors. That's usually about 15 people. They have all the power. They decide what the business produces. They decide what technology it uses. They decide where all this is going to happen. 
and they decide what to be done with the product, with the outcome, with the revenue. A tiny group of people decide it, and a mass of people do the work. The employees have no control. When you cross the threshold into a, a place of business, a factory, an office, a store, you're entering a place where there's somebody who can tell you, this is what you're going to do, you employee. You're going to sit over there. You're going to work with that machine. You're going to handle these pieces of paper, and you're going to do this activity, and you're going to do it for eight hours, and then I don't want to see you for a while. Go home, have a pizza, have a beer, go to sleep, and come back tomorrow, and I'll tell you what to do then. You don't elect these people. You have no authority over them. And if they don't like you, they can fire you. Take your job, take your income, plunge your family and community into all the problems. That, that's not democratic, folks. That's the opposite. I like so, to tell a joke. I like to tell a joke that drives it home. Once upon a time, we had kings who, who behaved this way who told everybody else what to do. We were The rest of us were all known as the king's subjects. When the king went by, we got down on a knee, or we took off our cap, or we, we demonstrated that we're subordinate to them. Well, after a while, we couldn't stand it as a human race, and we got rid of kings and queens, sometimes by separating their heads from the rest of their bodies, but I won't go into that, okay? But they played the game on us. They fooled us. The kings survived, and so did the queens. They changed their name. They changed their outfit, and they have a new name. It's called CEO. Inside the modern corporation, the CEO is the king. The workers that he can hire and fire have no vote, no election, no nothing. They have no power at all. The CEO is responsible only to the shareholders. So I can remind everyone in the United States, the 10% richest people own 80% of the shares. That's who owns the economy of this society, a tiny minority. That's why the, the Occupy Wall Street slogan of 1% was so powerful, because in a way it captured all of what I've just tried to say in a simple line. That's what this book tries to do, to show you that the things you have half of an understanding because of your own life and your own thought, I can help you take that, realize what wisdom you already have, and take it up a few notches. It's a little bit like a chef. You're a good cook, you do wonderful things, but a good chef can teach you how to make a good dish even better. Use this spice, uh, cook it in this way. Learn something from the cuisine of the Caribbean or Scandinavia that can help make this dish that you enjoy even more uh, enjoyable for your family. I'm trying to take the critical insights of the last 200, 300 years of capitalism and condense them into something that's a critical appreciation of capitalism. Doesn't deny its strengths, doesn't deny what it's achieved, but it says, and the premise is, I don't want to mislead anyone, the premise is we can do better than capitalism. So here's a book that'll show you how and why that's the case. So, so Rick, uh, defenders of capitalism say it's the uh, it's the best system. It's the most efficient. It rewards effort. That that the people who rise to the top deserve to be there through their hard work and by taking risks. And if the if society is lopsided with Elon Musk's and Mark Zuckerberg's, well, that's the natural order of things. And 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 to complain about it is is typically regarded as unpatriotic. Right. Yes, absolutely. One of the myths, and by the way, I deal with exactly this idea in the book. If you look at the in the in the chapter on the myths, it, it's dealt with. But let, let me summarize the response. Every system, slavery, feudalism, capitalism, all the systems of the past, 
made the same claim. They all made the claim, we are the greatest there ever was. We are the natural way things are. And anybody who wants to go beyond it is a fool because they don't understand this is, this is the best and this is what nature does. Under slavery, for example, including in the United States, although we've had slavery all over the world at various times, but in the slave systems, they taught people that human beings naturally fall into two kinds of people, masters and slaves, as naturally as some of us are male, some of us are female, even though nowadays we are learning late in the game that that's not so clear anyway where the one line and, you know, where the boundary of one is and where the other one is. Well, after a while, people said, no, we don't accept the notion that it's natural that some people are men, uh, some people are uh, masters and others are slaves. And they said, by the way, the same thing happened in feudalism. I am the Lord of the manor. Why <laughs> we call God Lord, that comes from feudalism. That could... The, the highest thing most little serfs in their rural area could imagine was the local lord. So the god was like a big one, even bigger. It was up in the sky, you know. Our lord lives in a castle. People then thought, well, there's just something special about them. There isn't anything special about them. The revolutionaries against slavery, what was their slogan? We're all people. We don't fall into master slave. We don't have to have this. The world won't come to an end if we stop having masters and slaves. It was very hard to convince people who had been living for a long time under slavery that there was no necessity for it. Same thing in feudalism. And what you're pointing out is that capitalism borrowed that strategy. And there's no surprise why. If you think about it, masters are a very small number. Slaves, very large. Lords are a small number. Serfs, very large. According to the U.S. Census, the number of employers in America is at most 3% of the population. The rest of us are employees. They better come up with a good idea because otherwise it's only going to be a matter of time and not much time before those of us who are employees, 97%, are going to overwhelm the 3% who are at the top. They've got to be able to control. If you, if you allow a system that gives a small minority the kind of control that the people who are employers have, you're going to have trouble, envy, bitterness, and jealousy Always, you're going to have a society torn apart. The rich people are the ones, and you know, when you mentioned earlier that I went to Harvard, Yale, and Stanford, which I did 10 years of my life in those fancy schools, one of the things I learned to know and know real well was wealthy people, because I was one of the few who wasn't. My family were immigrants. I had no money at all. I, I had to go to scholarships, every one of those schools. But I, I met and got to know lots of really powerful, wealthy people. And I understood, I learned, the, the only way you can sustain a system that gives a small number of people, the board of directors in a corporation, uh, that kind of power, they're smart, those rich people. They know that they're a small minority. They know that they're vulnerable. They therefore have to make sure that they're safe. Well, safe from what? From the rest of us, who in our moments of difficulty will say, wait a minute, I need this to get my kid through college. That, that guy, Musk, has tens of billions of dollars. He can't even figure out how to spend. You took away 10 billion from him, he wouldn't notice it. It'll be like removing a quarter from your pocketbook. <laughs> but it would solve the problem of Millions of people, if we took away 10 billion from him, he wouldn't notice. What kind of a system is like that? Well, they develop ideas to keep them going. I call them myths. And one of the myths is that this is natural. Huh? What? Listen, let me assure you, I sat through 
10 years of Harvard, Stanford, and Yale. Surrounding me were the children of the richest people in the world. Okay. An awful lot of them couldn't hack it, couldn't finish. Psychologically, whatever it was, they couldn't do it. These are not geniuses. They, they're, they're just like everybody else. They have the same collection of problems and difficulties and hurdles. It's a make-believe story that there's something special going on there. There isn't. There never was. But they want you to think so. They want you to think there's something special. I make a joke sometimes. It goes like this. It's been easy, but it's a true. It's a true thing, but it's kind of like a joke. It's been harder for me to explain to people that nothing goes on at Harvard, Stanford, and Yale other than what they're used to at any other college in this country. I've had an easier time explaining what's wrong with capitalism. They're most Americans are more ready to believe that than they are when I start making fun of Harvard. It, it, they don't want, they need to believe that there's something special. I can't get them to understand there isn't. Half yeah. of the people, in case this is of interest to your audience, half of the people at Harvard that I met, including people that became friends of mine that are still friends of mine, they didn't want to be at Harvard. They went there because their parents made them go. Their family said, you must go, your, your grandfather went to Harvard and blah, 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 and you're going to take his place in the law firm or the, 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 the hospital or the doctor or whatever you're going to be, and you have to, you go to Harvard, you had to blah, blah. So they went. You know, you're 17 years old. You half don't know who you are yet anyway. So you go to Harvard. And they were all around me in my dormitory. They didn't want to be there. They didn't study because... They couldn't. They wanted to be a dog trainer. They wanted to be an athlete. They wanted to be somewhere else. They didn't want to do this. And therefore, they didn't learn. And that made them fall behind. You know how that goes. And after a few years, you really can't anymore. And they never wanted to in the first place. They were miserable. They were unhappy. Some of them turned to alcohol. Some of them turned to drugs because they were in a situation... That's who comes out of these institutions. They may pretend later, oh, I went to Harvard. Sure, fine. It helps you get a job. I wouldn't deny it. I don't think you would have heard of me if it was just me and my ideas and my big mouth. But the fact that I went to Harvard, Yale, and Stanford opens all kinds of doors. I'll tell you another story your, your, your readers will enjoy if I haven't told you already. One of my classmates at Yale who sat next to me was one of the very few women that was graduate. Graduate students in economics in those days were almost 100% male and 100% white, I might add. So there were two girls at that time, women now I would call them, but girls we called them then, they were our age. So I knew them because there were very few uh, young women in my class. Uh, one of the two of them was named Janet Yellen, right? Same teachers I had, same classroom, same professor, same everything. I know what she learned. She knows what I learned. I know she knows better than what she says. I know, Abby. I know what she learned. That's what happens there. It's a play. It's a finishing school for people who want a good career. And Janet Yellen certainly has moved up the world and up the chain and is now what she is, you know. I'm, I'm not being critical. I, I don't have a personal relationship uh, with her, but I sure know what she knows. I run literally the same PhD in the same institution. But I learned to use critical thinking, which I was taught as I was growing up was what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to ask questions. Again, that old American idea, you're supposed to be able to figure out how to do things better how to leave the world in a better way than the way you found it. I think that's what good people all over the society want to, well, I did it in economics. And I said, can we do better than capitalism? And I've spent a lifetime learning, yes, we can. And my book is an attempt to say, look, here's why. 
we we should think that way we can think that way and don't be stopped by stories like the one you told that somehow block that process oh you can't do better it's the best there is well what are you talking about let me give you an example I'm going to give you an example even of another capitalist society just to show you that the United States isn't the best even in terms of capitalism. Forget doing better than capitalism. I'm going to give you the example of the country outside of the uh, United States I know best, France. Why? My father was born in France. I speak French. I did since I've been a baby. English is actually my third language. My mother was German. My father was French. And I was born in Ohio. I'm an American like everybody else, but I have European back. So I know France. But here's the law in France right now. By the way, it's been the law in France for many decades. When you finish high school or college in France right now, and you take your first regular job, the employer, you could be maybe 20 years old or whatever, the employer is required to give you five weeks of paid vacation every year. That's the law. Why? Because you have a private life. You have a boyfriend, a girlfriend, a family, children, an elderly person. You care. Nobody cares. It's nobody's business. But you are to get five weeks off to do whatever it is that you need as a complicated human being to round out your life. And the employer is gonna pay for it. That was pushed through the legislature of France many years ago by socialists, but it is so popular in France that it's never been touched. No politician, left winger, right winger, or in the middle would dare because any any politician who said, I'm not going to allow this to continue, would be voted out of office in 10 minutes. So it's here. Let me give you a second example, also from France. But this is true for many other countries in Europe as well. When I still have family in France. When a child is born in our family in France, he or she is instantaneously covered by medical insurance. And they're covered till the day they die. It doesn't, this has nothing to do with your job, whether you're working, not working, you're covered. There's no medical insurance goes with your job the way we have here. So if you lose your job, oh my goodness, now you're going to not be able to go see the doctor or visit the hospital. If you're injured, if you get sick, it is a social responsibility. Okay. We don't have that in this country. We don't have anything like it. And look, when I went, I was a visiting professor some years ago at the University of Paris in France. Right? If you're a professor for more than a month, which I was, you get a little card so you become a member of their national health service. I got sick during the month I was there. I needed a, a strep throat test, you know, the way you can get when you have that kind of a problem. So I went to the doctor and they took all care of me. And I said, how much does this cost? And they laughed and they said, it didn't cost you anything. A certain amount is taken out of your check every week, like, a, you know, like income tax, like social security. And that covers your medical. And, you, and then I realized there are no clerks here. There are no secretaries. There are no receptionists. When you go to visit the doctor, there's the doctor. You give the doctor your card. He says, hello, I'm the doctor. You say, hello, I'm the patient. And they do their thing, you know, check you and test you and take blood or whatever they have to do. And then you talk to them. I, mean, I speak French, so it's easy for me. You talk to them and they say, we don't spend money on medical care the way you do in America because we don't have an army of secretaries and clerks and record keepers who spend most of their time fighting with an army of insurance people over how much you are or not going to be covered by the insurance. All of those people are being paid and we charge you to pay for them. We don't have that in France. So we don't have to charge you a crazy amount of money. What I'm trying to get at here is things Americans imagine 
<laughs> the most efficient. It's not efficient to have medical care done in a capitalist way. I'll give you six minutes of my attention. You give me $400. What are you doing? A doctor is a healer. It, he or she is supposed to have a warm, understanding knowledge of you. That takes time. If you want to take care of people properly, you got to give them the, you can't be nickel and diming them. Here, give you another example. Over the last 10 years, 500 or more four-year colleges have closed in the United States. This is lunacy. Our population is growing, but our educated population is shrinking. We're supposedly in a life and death competition with China, which, by the way, we are. The Chinese are expanding their colleges, growing them very fast. We're shrinking ours. That's crazy. That's shooting yourself in the foot. What is going? Well, if you ask the colleges, why are you closing? Oh, they all answer in the same way. We can't make it as a business. We can't bring in enough students paying tuition to pay the cost of the professors and, and maintaining the college. You know, I make a joke. You make the, the, the statement, we run this college like a business. I'm telling you, you're crazy. It is not a business. It is a question of giving people a wholly different life, a life of knowing books and knowing what the world has accomplished so that they can go further and do more and get all of that out of life. It's like saying to a person, can you live on oatmeal three times a day? Probably. Put a little milk in it maybe some lentils, but if you could eat a whole balanced diet, you'd have a much better time. Take my word, I'm, I'm French, right? Take my word for it. What you eat makes a difference in life. Learn that there are different kinds of vegetables and meats and starches and all that. You'll have a much more lovely life that way. It, for me, education is, that is something we can give to our children's and generation to pass on what we've learned and to give their life a, a richness. Think how valuable each of us feels about what we got from our parents or grandparents or whoever helped us as kids. We remember the ones who were kind to us, who gave us uh, a, a good support when we needed it. Well, the system can do that. So what are you doing? Closing colleges. What, what a crazy idea. What, and then when someone said, well, we have, we can't make money. Uh, again, I'm saying, okay, so we allow Elon Musk, and I, I want to be fair here, Warren Buffett and Bill Gates and all the rest of those characters to run around with tens, or in the case of some of them, hundreds of billions of dollars, we don't tax that away from them. Meanwhile, we we are over a million kids now have who were in college, couldn't finish. By the way, it's a lovely move. You have a, a young person borrowed $80,000 for the first two years of college. The college closes. They're stuck. They can't finish their education, but they have to pay back the 80 grand they borrowed for the first. What, what happens to them? Everybody goes, I don't know. I don't know. What kind of a system? That's capitalism. No, it's up to them. Here's a little footnote. In France and Germany, the cost of a college education, like at the University of Paris, where I taught, is zero. Zero. You have to take care of your room and board. They don't, I mean, like you would have had to anyway. You have to feed yourself. You have to have your own clothing. But there are no costs for the education. Germany is taking it further. Not only is the cost zero, but you don't have to be German to go. There are 25,000 Americans right now in Germany getting their college degree for zero because they didn't want to come out of college with debt. And the wow. way to do that was to, you know what that is? That's a comment on American capitalism. The next time someone tells you, this is the best there is, no, it isn't. No, it isn't. And the reality is we're living more and more in a fantasy world. And this book I wrote is attempted to break that, to say, don't live in a fantasy. Here's the reality. 
and I say to people who are who like capitalism, that's okay. I have nothing, no problem. Read this book. You'll understand capitalism better by having the the, the courage to read a book of criticism. It's a little bit like if you wanted to understand, let me use a metaphor. If you want to understand the family lives up the street from you, you know that your mother, father, a couple of kids, and you want to understand them. So you take a notebook and I'm going to go interview them. And But you've heard some rumors. One kid really thinks it's the greatest family. The other kid thinks it's a psychological basket case. Would you interview only one kid? And the <laughs> answer is, of course not. You'd interview both of them. Then you'd make your, you might end up deciding one kid's right and the other one's wrong, but you would listen to both of them because you want to get the best picture you can. Well, the same is true of capitalism. Most Americans live in, this, in a bubble. Everybody's cheerleading capitalism. We have two political parties, Republican and Democrat. They differ on important issues. I get that. But you know one thing they don't differ on? Capitalism. They are, they are two parties that support capitalism. Okay, that's okay. But if we had a, a proper society, we would also be able to listen to a political party that was a critic of capitalism. So we could hear both sides, like talking to both sons in that family, the one who likes it and the one who doesn't. We have that. The book is an attempt to remedy the absence in our culture of a critical tradition towards capitalism. I want my book to help build that in people that are interested enough to read a short, accessible volume. So um, I, for one, benefited from your years of teaching, um, from being in the room when you were explaining things. And I can remember one time when you were um, at Occidental College at an event that Dick and I helped to organize. Right. And it was, I don't know, I know exactly what it was that you said, but a light bulb went off for me. And it became so clear to me that because of the imbalance of power that is created because of capitalism, that it produces an inevitability of inequality and a lack of democracy. Right. In fact, it's it's almost like a cancer to democracy. And so I want you, as, as we close, um, you haven't talked very much about the cancerous effect of capitalism. You haven't talked about climate change. You know, we haven't, you, you talked a little bit about in, in the, the colleges and universities getting smaller because they can't generate the profit. Right. There's no, there's no incentive for um, investing socially in communities. So can you talk a little bit about the damages of capitalism? Absolutely. Let's start with the base, the most simple way to get at this. Most enterprise, not all, but most enterprises are organized, as I said, with a small group of people at the top who make all the decisions. I can't overemphasize that. General Motors has, I don't know, 100,000 workers. Uh, you pick any large corporation. But the board of directors, 15 people. That board, those 15 who are chosen by the shareholders, and remember, 10% of shareholders have 80% of the shares. So it's that 10% that chose those electors, those board of directors, those 15 people. They will decide what you produce, how to produce, where to produce, and what to do. So they have extraordinary power, and the workers have no power over them. The, the board can fire you. You can't fire the board. I mean, real simple. All right, that's your experience if you're an American. 99% of us in the factory, the office, the store, we become used to the normalized situation that we have no power. We don't. I don't want to work over there today. I want to work. It's not your decision, Jack. Your supervisor will tell you where you work. I have to go to the bathroom. No, you don't. What? All right, you got two minutes. What is this? Well, this is not a democracy. The workers didn't get together to decide what are the rules, what are the patterns, what's going to... Oh, no. When you're fired... 
to have two security guards come and escort you out of the building. That's how much power you got. Which foot to put in front of which other foot? That's it. The rest, you're told. So you never can have a democracy if that's where adults spend five out of seven days of their life at work in a non-democratic, an anti-democratic. The workplace in capitalism is autocratic. A tiny group of people, like in a kingdom, like in a monarchy, tell everybody else what to do. And when they're tired of you, you're fired. You're too old, you're too sick, you don't have the right skills, who cares? Your family depends on you, who cares? The community needs you to have that job, who cares? The second thing, which goes right with the first one, is that the name of the game in capitalism is profit maximization. Profit is the bottom line. Profit is why we're in business. I've taught at business schools, that's what they teach. But think now with me as a child, Mike, simply. The, the things that most people get out of their job is called the wage. The thing that rich people get out of your job is the profit. If the business is run to maximize profit, here's what they're telling you. We run this business to be mostly concerned with what we at the top get, the profit, not with what you get, the wage. In fact, they're always looking to economize on labor costs. That's a polite way of saying we're trying to figure out how to do with fewer workers or how to get away with paying few workers less. They're always trying to, to pay less to the worker so there'll be a bigger profit at the end. To be told on, out front that we're in business to make a profit, that's a polite way of saying we're in business, we're going to take care of us the people at the top, and we don't care about you. We're not here for you. We're not here to make wages good for you. We're here to make profits good for us. What Americans don't understand is it's right there. There's no secret. I'm not telling you anything that isn't said every day in, a, in the board of directors room in every American corporation. That's not a democratic system. A democratic economy would say we're here for everybody. We're just as interested in improving wages as we are improving profit. You never hear that. You never hear wages is the bottom line. Well, wages is what most people get. Right. So in a democracy, hmm, that should be like number one. Profits is what a small number of people get. That should be number two. We've got it all wrong, upside down. We make profits the primary and wages the afterthought. That's not democracy. And that absence, that non-democratic economics infects everything else. Even even oh, people, not we even get angry and, and we get angry at workers who don't vote. Yes. I wish they would vote. I, I'm in favor of it. Look, you want to use everything you got, you gotta vote, use it. But I sure understand why half of the American people don't vote. They look at this and they say, this has got nothing to do with me. And they're right. It's the same way a worker, and it's a wonderful story. The worker is about to leave the factory and notices that the light is on in the bathroom. And they're the last one out. So they know that if they don't go in there and turn that light off, that light's going to burn all night until the next shift comes in, and that's going to waste energy and waste money and waste electricity. Now, if the workers themselves owned and operated that workplace, that worker would go in and turn that light off because they would understand this is me and my livelihood I'm protecting. But if they're not, if they're not, if that's somebody else's worry, why should they take a moment out of their time? They're going to leave the factory and do what most workers do when they leave the factory. Go find a place that says on the outside, happy hour. By the way, that happy hour on the bar, I love that. Because it's a statement to the American worker that we call this the happy hour. Because the hours at work before you got to the bar, they're the other kind of hour. <laughs> and you have to compensate for, but it's an admission, you know, without meaning to, they're admitting, yeah, you're unhappy because you're a robot. You're told what to do. 
That's why Sharon's point is very, very important. You can't have a political democracy if it's sitting on top of an economic non-democracy. That is a crazy system. Yeah, yeah. If we well, really I... believed in democracy, we would have made the workplace democratic from the beginning. We've never done that. We've never allowed democracy to come in to the factory, the office, and the store and be the way we work it out. Well, I think that we've never done that because that was never the intention. But that's a whole different, that's a whole different discussion. Well, Rick, um, we come to the conclusion of another wonderful discussion with you. We cannot endorse this book more highly. It's it is understanding capitalism for me is um it, it sort of takes these high level complex concepts and makes them accessible to anybody with a sixth grade education. So thank you, thank you, thank you. And how do people get this book? The easiest way is to go to our website. It'll all be out, laid out there, how to do it. Click of a button, you get the book. It's available both in a paperback and also as an ebook. If you wanna read it in your computer, you can get it that way too. Uh, so let me give you the websites, Democracy at Work, all one word, democracy at work dot info. Go there and it'll be right there on the front and you can follow it. Thank you so much, Rick. This was wonderful as always. As always. You're looking great. Thank you. And, and I'm glad you like the book, Sharon. What you just said about it is not just a personal compliment for which I thank you, but that's why I wrote the book, to help exactly to do that. So if it did it for you and hopefully for others, then that's that's a, that justifies all the time and energy that I took away from my family to do it. Thank you, Rick. Take all care. Right. Thank you both. Thank you for sticking Very around. Good. If you like the LA Progressive content and the discussions we have here, please consider clicking the subscribe button below and also give us a thumbs up. That helps to grow our audience by feeding the algorithm, which helps to get this content in front of more eyes. Thanks for stopping by. We really appreciate your support.